Next to the stage is um, Sir Mark Prescott, which I'm sure you'll agree doesn't need much introduction. He's a renowned new market trainer here, and he is going to give us his insight into um, how the horse safety has improved. Um, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much indeed for uh, coming to this. Um, I think the worst job anybody's had in recent times in Newmarket was about 10 years ago, all trainers in Newmarket in order to have their licenses renewed, um, we had to go to a health and safety lecture, which lasted two days at the British Racing School. Now this poor man, what a job, absolutely. <laughs> The worst job ever, you know. And uh, he'd, have, he'd have had half a chance if he'd come in and said, look, this is supposed to take two days. I'm going to get it done in a day. You all want to listen to me. Every time you get a horse injured, every time you get a lad hurt, it costs you money, so let's get it done in a day. Everybody would have been fine. But I think Luca was there. He made a terrible mistake. He said, are we all sitting comfortably? There's an escape door here, an escape door there, an assembly point there, sort of riot took up place. From then on, you know, the poor man was in, in desperate trouble. And we got to lunchtime, and the riot had ended by lunchtime, and most people were dozing quietly. And he came on to dangerous occurrences. And he said, for instance, he said, uh, you might see your secretary reach for a high book, a heavy book, and the book fall to the ground. That would be classed as a dangerous occurrence. And you can put on one side of your book a dangerous occurrence. And then you can put what you're going to do about it. You might get a ladder. You might move your heavy book downstairs. So, of course, he'd lost everybody completely. You see. So we then went for lunch. But he was a very nice man. And two or three of us are on the phone just to see how things are getting on. And it was November and we'd all got yearlings cantering on the heath for the first time, and it was blowing a gale, and I'd got uh, eight or nine to go out, uh, ridden by eight or nine nincompoops, uh, <laughs> worth God knows how much money at the time they were bought, and the thought of these eight cantering up Warren Hill for the first time was plaguing me, and I was on the phone, and he said, oh, Sir Mark, are you ringing home? So I said, yes, I am, and he said, and uh, what are you trying to discover? I said, well, I've just had 16 dangerous occurrences going up, <laughs> going up Warren Hill, and I'm seeing what the survival rate is going to be. <laughs> so, um, you know, the poor man, it was a terrible thing. But it did make us think. And, uh, and uh, I think as a result, all of us were a, a little bit more careful. And I was trying to think of the things that have improved racehorse lives since, since I started training 54 years ago. And I think probably one of the most influential things was the advent of all weathers. When I started training in Newmarket, there were two sand canters and that was it. Uh, if your horse couldn't go on firm ground, you were in desperate trouble. So you had to get them going early in the year. They had to be fit fairly early while the ground was relatively trainable. And after that, they just got lamer and lamer as the summer went on. And then we got to the horses in training sale and the famous new market shuffle, horse after horse, went round here, uh, badly jarred up and either came round later or didn't. So I think all weather tracks changed everything. It changed new market in that when I came here, there were only 750 horses and 35 trainers. There are now 2,600 horses and 81 trainers. And that has only been possible because of all weather surfaces. Simply the grass wouldn't have taken those number of horses. Furthermore, you can see somebody like Dan Skelton uh, start training at Stratford. Rock hard ground, that clay. You could have no more trained horses there successfully, a large number, before the advent of all weather gallops. You had to be on the ridgeway. You had to be on decent draining land. Um, as soon as the all weathers became established, suddenly you could train anywhere. And that really did change everything. Um, <coughs> have they been made horses sounder? Yes, I think, you know, we don't damage as many as we used to. 
I think it's been an enormous advantage for horses. There have been problems, of course. In Newmarket, we were very lucky in that because we have such an enormous number of horses in training, every company that produced all weather surfaces wanted us to try them out. And it's quite a thought. We once had a man with a clicker at the top of Warren Hill, and it was February, roughly middle of February. The ground was frozen. Uh, the walking grounds were pretty bad, but the jockey club had, had made it so that we could more or less get to Warren Hill and canter. Every trainer then was wanting to do two canters, roughly. So how many horses do you think passed him in the day? 2,948 horses passed him in the day up Warren Hill. So your all-weather tracks got some punishment at Newmarket, and so we took on all those surfaces, and we experimented with them, and some were good and some were bad. Uh, but most were pretty good, um, and I think that's significantly improved um, the racehorse's life. Um, the next thing that I suppose really improved things was sedation um, of various sorts. It certainly meant that less strong vets, and may, may I say it, women probably could suddenly deal with large animals a lot easier. But for us in training, um, it made life so much better. Um, uh, there are some people there at the back of the room who will remember trying to clip that horse, which took three days, and in the words of the wrestling commentator, three falls, a knockout, and a submission to do one, to do one side of it, not to mention kicking the clippers and all those disasters, and you now whip round and, and clip these horses with a minimal, uh, minimal amount of damage. Uh, and then you can think of the times when we had lame horses, and uh, Mr. Crowhurst would come along and jingle his hand in his pocket and say, leave it in the box for three months. And then when you get it out, walk it in a straight line. But well, you, you try and walk it, Mr. Crowhurst, <laughs> after three months in a straight line. But so what we used to do is put some poor child on it, ride it round the box for a couple of days, and then it would be rode and led up the yard. How it survived, I don't know. Then we'd open Heath House gates, and the pair of them would thunder off into the distance. And they either came back together or separately. Um, and uh, that was it, you know. So sedation has significantly resulted in the lads living longer as, as well as the horses. And must be good in that must be good for us all in the end. That was a tremendous help. Uh, what it does mean, on the other hand, is that my staff have probably never seen a difficult horse in their lives. They've never seen a really difficult horse. They have no idea how dangerous it is and how dangerous it could be. Um, I have because I started with a wonderful person in Devon who used to, he had eight race horses in training and eight horses which he would only have if someone had tried to break them in and failed. <laughs> and he charged double for them. So it was a good, it was a good financial model. But the net result was that we had horses coming down from breaking yards all over Britain. And the worst came from Ayr to Melton Mowbray and then arrived with us. And he'd got no, his party trick was to chuck himself down as soon as you put a roller or a saddle on him. And he had no hair at all down the side of him. And the fellow in Melton Mowbray had set fire to the straw to get him up. So by the time they came to us, they'd seen everything. So um, the, draw, the drawback is that the modern lad has no comprehension of how dangerous a horse can be. Um, and that's probably a very good thing. The next thing that came along, of course, which was dealt with by the last lecture, was bone scans. And uh, looking back on those fillies that went lame behind, mainly fillies, um, looking back on the fillies who went lame behind, um, it was always a pulled muscle, we said. Uh, we left them in the box until they were sound. As soon as they were sound, weeks walking, weeks trotting, and then we started cantering. And the fracture that came eight weeks later, we really didn't correspond with the lameness that had been done before. Um, as a trainer, you're all scientists, you know best than me. But a very interesting, we, I do keep very careful records. And seven out of the ten fillies that go lame behind have, have, a, have a fracture if we scan them. Seven out of ten. Only one out of seven of the colts will. So when a colt goes lame, 
behind, I take it much less seriously and much more likely to be a, a full muscle than a filly. Now, whether that stands up to the rigorous uh, research of all of you, I don't know. But as a, as a trainer, that's what I find. And the other thing as a trainer is I find that I only have 50 boxes. We have 65 horses a year normally through our hands. And the records I keep are, are meticulous but general. And I injure the same number of horses every year. The only difference is that in a good year, I injure the bad horses. <laughs> and in a bad year, I injure the good horses. Uh, it's as simple as that. Uh, but the number of injuries remains strikingly the same. And, of course, your young trainers always come along to you when you're in your dotage. And the two qu things they always say to you is, so, Mark, I'm never going to work a horse up for whatever canter again. I, so I say, oh, dear, why is that? And I've had three fractures. So I say, well, where are you going to go? I'm going to try somewhere else. And I say, well, the trouble is, when you've been training as long as me, you'll have fractured three on every, on every bit of Newmarket Heath. The number of horses you work determines the number of of dam amount of damage you have. It's just a, almost a mathematical thing. And we try and ride these gallops better and so on as we train longer. But it's, it is mainly a mathematical thing, the number of horses you gallop. As long as you're careful, um, your injuries should not change much from one year to the next. Then there was scoping. Um, I think that's been a tremendous advantage. And surprisingly, you perhaps for all of you, I think it makes a, a, di a difference to the, the amount of injuries you have. I think horses who feel well use themselves properly, move properly, get hold of a bridle, they're more balanced, and the number of injuries you have with healthy horses when you have a good healthy season is definitely less than a year when you're having a job to get them healthy and keep them healthy. Um, and scoping, I, my only claim to fame, really, veterinary-wise, was I was the first person ever, ever, ever to scope a horse with Mike Burrell. And no vet in Newmarket would do it. And we had this marvellous idea, or I think, I think it was mainly my idea, that horses came in healthy, like children, from, from their families. And when they got to school, they all coughed and spluttered and wiped their noses on the back of their hands and were disagreeable for a year, like children. Um, and uh, so we went off and scoped a whole lot of ponies on Dartmoor who'd never, ever been off the hill in their lives, which you imagine nearly killed ourselves doing it. <laughs> and uh, as, as it was sucked out, I was confidently expecting everything to look like gin. And there was a... <laughs> and it all came out thick treacle. So my first theory was completely wrong. All the horses on Dartmoor had absolutely congested lungs, noses, and could hardly waddle. So... But we, we got better with, with um, what we were doing and antibiotics, and it, and it gave me a start. And uh, the interesting thing about that is that uh, the top trainers are always very quick to learn anything that's going on. And when I first built my covered ride, which is that hid hideous building, it should be the ugliest building in Newmarket, but it's way behind the Roman Catholic Church and... Uh, Waitroses. It finishes about seventh in the ugly buildings in Newmarket, but it's at the foot of that. And when I first built it, um, Michael Dickinson wanted to come round and look at it. And um, so, but he was quite secretive, Michael, and he'd heard about this and he said, Oh, can I come round and have a look at the covered ride? And I said, Certainly, Mr. Dickinson, love you to come. And, um, you know, uh, but if you're going to have a snoop round Heath House, um, I'd like to have a snoop round Harewood. So he said, oh, I'm afraid that's not. I said, well, please, you fuck yourself. <laughs> so, um, so, so he said, all right. So he came and had a look round and measured everything. And I went up to Harewood, and it was absolutely marvellous. And he was winning 12 races on, uh, on a boxing day. He had the first five home in the Gold Cup. He was rewriting the whole job. And they were marvellous. Gave you a great trip round. And the big thing that I grasped from it was, I don't know anything about national hunt racing, but if you want to be champion trainer and change all the records, you want to do lots of long canters, lots of road work, lots of long exercise, and occasional sharp work. I've got it, you see. So uh, anyway, we started scoping with Mike Burrell, and within three years, 
phone call came from Mr. Pike, Daddy Pike, David Pike, my, Martin's father. Now then, boy, he says, I hear you're doing this scoping that. So I said, I am Mr. Pike. He said, well, he said, can I come down when you've got scoping going? I said, of course you can, Mr. Pike. But if you're going to have a snoop round Heath House, <laughs> I'd like to have a snoop round Nickel Shane. He said, ah, we can't have that, boys. So I said, well, please your fucking self. <laughs> so he came down. He came down, and we had a wonderful day there, and I went up to Nickel Shane, and he now was almost beating Mr. Pike's records. Almost. And as I drove back, I realized that you must never, ever do road work. You must never canter more than five furlongs, and you must never be out for more than 45 minutes. So the two people were doing it completely and utterly differently, but were achieving that. So anyway, I've had a bit of time to think about it, and I don't know what you all think. You can know more than me, but I think that what it is, is it probably as a trainer, doesn't matter what you do, as long as your method gets them very, very fit and doesn't drive them mad. That was the interesting thing. They worked them very hard, and the horses were, were very relaxed. So uh, maybe the scoping and the... Covered ride got me more information than I realised. <laughs> and the last thing before I must, I'm, I'm, I've got to shut. The last thing is that the race courses have got so much safer. Um, I rode at Aintree when I was 17. Mrs. Um, Mrs. Topham was selling the track. Um, um, the corrugate arm was blowing everywhere. It was pouring with rain. Uh, nobody went. There were few people at the Grand National at our point to point. Seven and a half thousand people were there when Anglo won the Grand National. That's all. 94,000 went this year. So they, they've done a fantastic job getting everybody to go again. But there was nobody there. It was derelict. Davis is going to sell it. We're walking around down at the start. And my great friend was called Neil Koenig. And he was, they were so kind to me, the family. And Neil's walking around. He's tying a knot in his rein. And 28 were, go were going to fall on the first circuit. 28 were going to fall, not brought down. 28 were going to fall on the first circuit. And Neil's tying a knot in his reins. And he said, do you know, he said, we're, we're all going to get killed. And there's not a hunt here to see us. <laughs> and, and, and that's what it was like. That's what it was like. You're all going to get killed and there weren't many people to see you. So... Um, but they've done a fantastic job there in um, making it safer, and, and except for Beaches Brook, which looks terrible, it, it still retained its fear factor. But, of course, you've got the horror now that the, 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 the jockeys are going quicker because the fences are smaller. We used to half go down the outside, half go down the inside. Now there's no drops. Everybody's cottoned on. They want to be on the inside. So you can go on trying to make these things safer. And it's, it's very hard to know what the authorities can do now. It's interesting that only four fell in this year's Grand National and 13 were unseated. It's quite a thought, really. I mustn't say that. The Professional Jockeys Association would be on to me. Uh, and then um, why, um, sort of those old race courses, I broke my back at Y. And um, it was seven furlongs round in Kent. Um, uh, Rock Hard Grand, they only re used to work race in May and at the, uh, in the autumn. And they always put sheep on the track. Um, and the weighing room was where they did all the lambing. And they'd, they'd chase them out in May, and then you'd have the May meeting. And uh, the three-mile chase, you could, went round three and a half, four times past the stand. And the king jockey out there was Jimmy McNaught, who's still alive and up the north. Some of you may know him. He was king round Y. And there was a fellow called Val Godden. And Val would ride anything. God knows what's happened to the man, but he would ride anything. And we were riding in a three-mile chase, and the weighing room smelt all of these sheep that had only just gone. There was wire all the way around the track. And uh, Val arrived down at the start on this thing, which had got a standing martingale yellow bandages which hadn't been put on properly, you know, when complete lunatics have put them on, clip one side and not the other because they'd obviously failed to do the other side. And five runners, you see, and he arrived at this thing's walking round like this. 
And uh, Jimmy McNaught said to Val, what the hell are you doing, right? Oh, he said, it's fine. He said, it jumps some straw bales the other, oh, for God's sake. <laughs> so anyway, we, we cantered off steadily into the first, and of course, we jumped about two, and there's this terrible cry from behind. The boy said, look out, and this thing came sailing through. <laughs> ricocheted between three or four of us, hit the fence and turned over absolute somersault. Anyway, three mile, three and a half miles we got, and Jimmy at the north, north looks around, he said, oh, gee, gee, did you see that? Oh, yeah. So anyway, the next circuit we're around, and we look at the fence, and there's Val, and there's a couple of those ambulance men that used to wear those black jackets and the white cross belts, and they're over him, you know, and he, we can see he seems to be blood everywhere, and he's convulsing. So next time we go around, the, the ambulance men still haven't got near him, and he's, <laughs> and Jimmy said, oh, did you see him? And next circuit, of course, we're going flat out. When we get back to the weighing room, there's Val gone, standing there absolutely fine. We said, you're supposed to be dead, Val. What the hell are you doing? <laughs> he said, well, I was tangled up in the electric fence, he said. I was getting, <laughs> <up>. <laughs> I was, I was getting all these bolts, he said. And <laughs> no one would come and rescue me. Either. So the answer is it's improved for everybody. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much, Sir Mark. That was great. <laughs>